Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of Stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing the planet, threatening our communities, and harming our health. My teenage daughter is a smart kid. She reads the newspaper, follows current events on social media, and listens very carefully to the conversations I and my friends have about the state of the world. So she knows that our planet is plagued with a Pandora's box of environmental, economic, and social problems. Like anyone who's paying attention to what's going on, particularly to the way carbon pollution is disrupting the Earth's climate, she worries about the future. She often asks me what the world will be like for her children. Knowing what to say to her is tough. I don't want to be a Pollyanna and downplay the very real threats we're facing. Yet I also don't want her, at age 14, to feel the full burden of the mess that we're in. This is a problem all of us face as parents. How to make our kids aware of the problems, but not afraid. And if you're like me, you're not only working to preserve a livable planet for your kids, you also want to encourage them to take appropriate action themselves. I believe taking action is the best antidote to feeling overwhelmed. Striking the right balance is a real challenge, and parents need support and resources to take it on. Today's guest is building an organization to do just that, mobilize parents as a powerful force to combat climate change, give them a place to share their concerns with others, and provide support for this most important task. We'll hear more about this new group, talk about the challenge of reassuring kids while raising them to be aware and active, and find out how you can get involved. It's a fascinating conversation, so let's go. You may remember our two-part podcast last summer featuring interviews with leading changemakers, asking, among other things, how to get started with a campaign to make change. One of our guests was Lisa Oyos, a campaigner for environmental and social justice for more than two decades. Big corporations don't like citizen engagement. They're trying to fight it. They're trying to make money speak louder than the power of people. Back then, she was the director of the California office of the Blue-Green Alliance, an organization working to build the clean energy economy and the jobs needed to make it happen. Since then, she's taken on a new challenge, co-founding and directing a new organization called Climate Parents. As a mother of two young boys, it's a subject close to her heart. Born out of a concern that climate change is affecting kids and communities around the world and the sense that parents can help advance the urgent and bold climate solutions that our kids deserve, I'm really pleased to welcome my dear friend and longtime colleague back to The Good Stuff. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Annie. It's great to be here. And so your job with Climate Parents is to make it easier for parents to get involved. Is that right? Yes. And... We, I've learned a lot, you know, with changing technology about the power of online organizing. The great convergence of activist energy is when you can integrate reaching people online and then moving people on the ground. And so that's the approach we take. But for those parents who just don't have an extra minute to spare outside of reading an email and signing a petition, there's that option. But ultimately, to build the kind of power we want to build, we're going to have to identify parents out there. They do not have to be activists, like regular parents who are willing to commit an hour, willing to commit three hours, willing to attend a hearing, willing to help uh, get solar panels on top of their children's school. And when I think about the kind of skills it takes to be a change maker, no one is more equipped with those skills than a parent, right? <laughs> we know how to juggle lots of logistics. We know how to budget. We know how to figure out the most efficient way to get around things. We know how to frame complicated issues in accessible and non-threatening ways because we are doing that all day when we're explaining to our kids how to be safe out on the street, how to choose their food wisely. I mean, parents innately have these skills that are needed to make a better future. The more that one learns about climate, the more absolutely terrifying it is. I mean, this is really, really scary stuff. So it's a challenge as a parent. How do we talk to these about these issues to our kids without scaring them? I, I often think about how do we make them aware without being afraid when the information is really scary? What advice do you have for parents about how to talk to their kids about these issues? You really do have to sort of meet your child where they are at in terms of what they understand about the world uh, and too much sort of doom and gloom. And I think it's true for anybody, for adults as well. Uh, 
put can immobilize people and the goal for us is to mobilize people so there's the scientific dimension of it and helping kids understand why this is happening and that pollution from carbon and from burning fossil fuels is what's causing it and um explaining how the science works is one piece but i think it's critical to quickly then pivot to what we can do about it and i think what we can do about it can be explained um sort of in an age appropriate way but at two levels one is what we can do in our own life here every day in our home you know the the carbon footprint stuff the the recycling the using water more efficiently the carpooling the biking etc but then i think for me and i think to try to build the kind of uh consciousness we want to build with our kids so they can be change makers as they grow up is like and here's what we can do to mobilize because ultimately we have to have a political shift ultimately our our mayors need to think about how we run our cities differently just how we think about running our house differently they have to think about how they run their cities differently and what role can we play in that maybe that's the most accessible because it's our city it's our mayor it's our council members there's questions about waste and um you know methane which comes from landfills if you don't have as much uh organic matter, banana peels going to the waste stream, you don't have as much carbon pollution. Huge one around mass transit, making sure that's funded. Maybe that's kind of the easiest level to go at. But then, you know, you have the president talking about Sasha and Malia and talking about regulating power plants. Power plants cause 40% of our carbon pollution and contributing hugely to asthma and such. And there's opportunities uh, to to weigh in at that level now too, especially through the internet. Like over the course of the next year, the EPA is going to be putting in place regulations on existing power plants. And we have opportunities just sitting in our living room to go to the EPA website and submit a comment. And kids can do that too. We talked about that in our film, The Story of Change. There's so much attention and guidance about sort of the 10 simple things you can do in your house to lessen the impact. And what we say is those are a great place to start, but they are a terrible place to stop. So start in your kitchen, making change in your kitchen, but then move to making change in your community. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And probably the biggest area of focus for us, there's there's really two, but one is going to be um, talking about the importance of going from dirty to clean energy and putting kind of the vision and understanding in our collective mind in this country that we can get to 100% clean energy. We can do that uh, in a generation. Well, that's so hopeful to listen to you rattle off all these different ways that we can get involved because sometimes the climate challenge just seems so overwhelming. It's hard to figure out where to plug in. What are um, climate parents' top priority in the coming year? One area is um, fighting for 100% clean energy and transitioning from dirty to clean energy. For example, here in California, um, the San Onofre nuclear plant is closed now and groups like Friends of the Earth and others had a big role to play in that. And it's closed because there were radiation leaks and it was jeopardizing communities and community health. And we didn't want to have another Fukushima here in California. And there were all sorts of design flaws with that plant. So the question becomes, you had a very dangerous form of energy. We want to move to cleaner energy. The utility in L.A. could just buy more, build a new gas plant or buy a new gas plant somewhere here. We don't have so much coal. But we can go better. We can do better than that. We can transition to wind and solar and and. There's a pathway that citizen activists flexing our citizen muscle need to sort of step into and ensure if there's a fork in the road. We had bad and now we're going to like less bad. That's one pathway. And another pathway is are we going to go from the bad to the ideal? And the ideal is wind and solar. And so um, what dictates which way we go is really if we're flexing our city citizen muscles and getting involved and pushing those agencies as parents, pushing those agencies as environmental groups. There's even other great groups out there like Interfaith Power and Light, people of faith who care about creation, you know, getting those voices in there and just insisting that we have to do what we all know and so clear is a way of the future. But it's got to be the way of the present. And there's all sorts of industry oil lobbyists saying, oh, no, let's stay with fossil fuel. Let's stay with fossil fuel. And we have to say, 
we're ready for prime time. Renewables are here, and you have to invest in our kids' well-being. You have to invest in not, you know, continuing to have spiraling asthma rates, and you have to invest in ensuring that the climate problems we're already seeing aren't exacerbated in a way that spirals completely out of control. The real power we're fighting here is the fossil fuel lobby and their friends and allies in government. The oil and the gas industry uh, have huge influence in Congress, and that's through campaign, basically because of campaign finance rules and Citizens United, which I know you're working to mobilize um, your you know, membership around. Uh, so they can give unlimited money and they have unlimited money. And when you look at the amount, the millions and millions of dollars that Chevron and Exxon and um, Peabody Coal can spend on running huge TV PR campaigns to lining the pockets of members of Congress and senators, it's it's um, it's really it's really a tough battle for us. Having said that, I think what we have on our side is at the end of the day, sort of the truth. I think it's pretty intuitive for most people to understand that if you can invest in wind and solar and generate power from natural resources, that that's going to keep our communities healthier and it's going to keep our kids healthier. We talk a lot in Climate Parents about 100% um, clean energy, but also having energy that we call kids safe and climate safe. I think as parents, we really understand and get the whole notion of what is kids safe. We make sure that we put things in our light sockets so our kid, you know, our little toddlers don't put themselves at risk. We make sure that kids eat healthy food. A lot has changed in that space as it relates to what is kids safe on the food front. And we want to make the same jump around energy because energy comes in our home from somewhere. There was either a mountaintop that was destroyed to find coal that causes asthma to go into power lines that go to your home, or there's a solar plant right outside your community that is sending that same solar to power your home. And so if we can really understand the connections between um, clean energy and our kids' health and well-being, I think we'll be taking a huge step in the right direction. Um, you said that we have truth on our side. The other thing that we have on our side is people. And I can think of no power stronger than the um, the power a parent feels when they are protecting their child. I mean, I would do anything to keep my child safe. And that means reducing my carpet carbon footprint. That means getting, going to sometimes boring city council meetings. <laughs> that means signing petitions. That means marching in the streets. I mean, that tapping into that incredible well of of power and desire to keep our kids safe, I feel I can overcome any amount of campaign spending and uh, contributions that the oil companies can make. Right now, what we're doing is um, trying to engage as many parents as we can in what I've been referring to as these dirty to clean energy fight in, um, in the Pacific Northwest right now. There's a huge effort to export coal, and that's because coal companies um, in the Midwest and the Southeast and, and in Virginia and other coal producing states, they're running out of market share in the United States. And so the way they can keep mining coal and, you know, removing mountaintops to get it and so on is if they can ship it to China. But as people who care about climate change and sort of do what we call the carbon pollution math and try to understand, you know, what poses really, really big risks to making climate change even worse, we know that that is a really important thing to stop. So we are working with parents who have said they're really interested in helping us be successful with this. And it's not just climate parents working on this. It's a lot of environmental groups on the ground in those two states. It's also the Sierra Club playing a major role. And we ask parents to come to hearings. We ask parents to sign petitions. We ask parents to even just share this information with their friends and families to kind of broaden the base of people who understand what's going on and who will get involved. So that's maybe a high, you know, from low to high level of involvement, the low level, I guess, but an important level that nevertheless is signing the petition and making your voice heard that way. And the higher level of engagement is heeding the call when we ask folks to come to petitions and come to press conferences and that kind of thing. The other big campaign area in terms of climate science and, and something I didn't talk about yet, but solar on schools, because it's in development, we're looking at trying to create a way for any parent in any school district to have kind of the basic tools and organizing you know, kit 
that they would need to um, – help ensure that their kids' school has solar panels. So that's in development still, but that's something that is a little distinct from the dirty to clean energy work we're doing. It's much more localized and it's much more sort of do-it-yourself organizing, but we want to provide support to parents who are willing to move in that direction. Another piece that relates to uh, schools is climate science. And we've been working hard on a campaign to ensure that something called the Next Generation Science Standards are adopted in all 50 states. The National Academy of Science has a sort of policy arm that worked with representatives from 26 states to develop core science standards, 21st century science standards that include climate science. And it's critically important to ensure that our kids get climate science in their um, K-12 education. And there was a survey done by the National Center for Science Education that found that a very small percentage of kids are getting um, are getting climate science taught in school currently. So if we standardize it, then it just be, it's not just an innovative, forward-thinking teacher who makes sure her kids get that, but it's really built into the school standards. And so we have um, worked with parents and grandparents in states like even Kentucky and Kansas. And I guess the reason I say even Kentucky and Kansas is because some people think of those places because of the fights we've seen historically on evolution versus creationism as states that will reject climate science. And there are legislators in both of those states who have said we do not want our kids to learn climate science and have even tried to move bills in the legislature to block the next generation science standards from being implemented. But getting back to what you said about people power, we did a petition in the state of Kentucky, and in just a matter of days, 4,000 Kentuckians said, we are standing up for our kids having a 21st century science education that includes climate science. So we were able to go to hearings, we were able to get local parents to stand up and take our petitions and deliver them to the State Board of Education, and um, those standards have been adopted. So we're doing that in states across the country, and that's a really important part of helping kids get the foundation they need to to then implement climate solutions. If you understand the basis of the problem and you understand it, you know, climate change is being caused by burning fossil fuels, then they're much more primed to want to embrace the alternatives like solar and wind. So for a listener to this podcast, if they want to find out if their state has adopted these new science standards, is that information available on the Climate Parents website? Yes. Parents can go to our website and they can look up their state and see what the state of play is around next generation science standards being adopted in their states. Our first priority is the 26 states that work to develop these standards because they already are kind of, they're in progress and their state boards of education will be hearing um hearing or adopting them or not adopting them. But then we'll move on to the other 24 states. And what we need is parents uh, and grandparents who want to help make sure their kids learn climate science. And if you just get in touch with us, we'll hook you up. And what's your website? It's um, www.climateparents.org. Thank you, Annie. As I said, the best antidote to worrying about a problem is getting involved in trying to fix it. The same is true for our kids. When they ask us why rainforests are being cut down, communities are being poisoned by toxic chemicals, or the weather is becoming weirder and more dangerous, we should explain honestly. But then we should add that we don't have to sit by helplessly and watch it happen. Sure, the opportunities for a 14-year-old to get involved aren't necessarily the most strategic or hard-hitting, but they plant a seed that can grow future change-makers. Today, she might write to President Obama asking him not to approve the Keystone Tar Sands Pipeline, organize a shoreline cleanup with her friends, or hold a bake sale for typhoon victims. Tomorrow, she might run for the student council on a platform of reducing waste in the classroom and cafeteria. And beyond that, the future is in her hands, and I want her to know that she has the responsibility and the power to help shape it. How about you? What do you say when your kids ask about the future of the planet? We'd really like to hear from you. You can send us comments through storyofstuff.org, where you'll also find links to resources to help you answer these tough questions. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowlands. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org 
and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.